Well, forged by the strength of family, a commitment to service, and a determined spirit, Bobby Kennedy dared to take on issues that others were too timid to try. As an advocate, he challenged the injustice of racism. As a politician, he fought to tear down the walls that divided a nation. And he left behind a legacy that ignited the passions and sense of truth and freedom in his children. Well, today, with the help of our special guest, we'll give you an intimate look into the life of this American visionary. But first, joining me around the table is De Havilland Ford. How are you? I am awesome, and I'm so excited about this program. I believe it's going to shed light on a very important issue in our time. I think that's so, so, so true. And it, I think it's, it's so, we can learn from those that have gone before us. Yeah. And especially, I think, to give honor where there are certain you know, things that happen in a person's life that we can celebrate. I think it's good to do that. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. How are you, Cindy Johnston? I'm doing great today, thank you. It's good to have you here. You look beautiful, I like your necklace. Thank you. I like it too. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Rebecca like Lamb Weiss, new mother of Boaz, how are you? Yes, mom of two, hey. Mom of two, in this kind of rocky world, having two. I'm on the rock and boat, and I'm loving every minute of it. <laughs> All right, Cindy Murnock, how are you? I'm doing great, and I was just doing some calculation in my mind because I remember... Bobby Kennedy yeah. and all that the roles he played. I think I was like nine or ten years old back then, but you yeah. know, it was a huge thing for yeah. us when we were young. Yeah, we're going to talk about all of that. Well, he has long been a fighter for those who couldn't fight for themselves, a legacy he got from his father, and he's here to tell us more about that. Please welcome our friend Robert Kennedy Jr. Hello. That's just the right That's the perfect music, right, <laughs> to walk into. <laughs> Saunter right in. <laughs> well, it's so good to have you here. Uh, very good to be back with you, Johnny. And I'm so tickled that you're going to be talking about your dad. From a life of service in the Navy to the halls of the U.S. Capitol, Bobby Kennedy left an indelible mark on the fabric of history, and his legacy is one of bravery, hope, and family. But what made this man such a determined and passionate individual, and what legacy did he build for those who loved him most? Well, today Robert is here to share about his father, and the impact he made on his life. I know this subject is near and dear to your heart, and you carry the name. Yes. <laughs> it's so funny when people, when I'll say you're, you're on the show, they'll say, wait, is that the, is that the Robert F. Kenny Jersey? Yeah. yeah, it is the one. Yeah. So tell us a little bit, take us back kind of like to growing up in the Kennedy household. What, what early memories do you have of your dad? Well, I had, uh, my dad was one of nine children of Joseph Kennedy and Rose Kennedy. And they were kind of the, the second generation Irish immigrants. My, um, my grandmother's father, whose name was Honey Fitz, they called him Honey, Fitz, Honey Fitzgerald, uh, because he had a voice, he would sing at his campaign appearances. He was the first Irish Catholic mayor of Boston. And his parents were immigrants. My great-great parents were immigrants. They came over during the, uh, uh, to Boston during the potato famine in 1848 and 1849. My grandmother's father became the first Irish Catholic mayor of Boston. Um, she went out with my grandfather, Joseph Kennedy, who was a, um, you know, had been raised in this, uh, in this Irish Catholic milieu and had distinguished himself, had become a bank examiner, had attended Harvard and then become a bank examiner, one of the few Catholics at Harvard at that time. They had nine children and um, my father had 11 kids. And I was the third of the 11. Wow. And oh the, gosh. you know, we were raised basically on a seaside village on Cape Cod called Hyannisport with uh, where all of the families had houses. So I had 29 first cousins who were all wow. in that same town. Oh, and, my goodness. Um, you know, we were raised outdoors. We weren't allowed to come in during the daytime. Uh, we were raised fishing and diving and uh, you know, scuba diving and uh, sailing and then doing a lot of outdoor sports and a lot of team sports. Which a lot of I, animals. A lot of animals. I remember <laughs> reading that in your book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What do you remember, like, as far as some of the values that he taught you early on? Because I know that, I guess you were 14 when he passed, right? Yes. So let's go right back maybe... 10, 11, 12, 13, what are some of the things? Because he was involved in politics at that point, obviously. Yeah, I mean, he was involved in politics my whole life. 
mom, they, I was born in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. He was chief counsel of the Rackets Committee, um, where my, my uncle, his brother, he was campaign manager, his brother, John Kennedy, during the Senate campaign and during his congressional campaigns in the 50s. And he took on um, as one of the big causes this battle against the mafia. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, from when I was three or four years old, I was going to, my mother would take us to hearings instead of taking, I didn't go to nursery school or kindergarten, but we went to hearings. I saw um, my father uh, grill, you know, Joey Gallo and Sam Giancana, and uh, I saw Sam Giancana take the fifth, I think, 127 times. Um, wow. And, uh, and then, you know, they all, they brought politics home with them. They'd, so we, every night at the dinner table, we had a formal dinner. And my father would come to dinner and usually give us, uh, he was a very good historian and a very engaging historian. And he was an expert on the battles that had changed history. Mm. During vacations, we would tour the Civil War battlefields, the Revolutionary battlefields. Uh, he would talk to us about... I think his parenting strategy was to try to uh, imbue us with noble thoughts, to try to, um, you know, talk about this sort of heroic uh, side of history. Uh, we had to keep a daily diary on having read the newspaper and, and write down three news events to all of the children. On Sundays, we had to come to dinner equipped with a poem or a... Um, or a biography that we would recite during dinner. And then my parents and, uh, always had, there was always famous people at the dinner table because they were Supreme Court justices or congressmen or senator or cabinet members. And my house was a, uh, was kind of a, was a satellite White House. And so my uncle, the president, was there all the time our house in Virginia and, you know, and then members of his cabinet. And, but my parents always made a point of including us all in the conversation, having only one conversation at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. She didn't want a lot of, my mother didn't want a lot of people talking to each other individually. She wanted one conversation and she would go to them to see it. And then in the summer, it was very exciting during the White House years because the helicopters would come, the marine helicopters, three marine helicopters would come every Friday, and they would um, land on the football field, which was, there was a, we had a compound with many Kennedy houses inside of that compound, and there was a, it was on the sea. Uh, there was a football field where we played football, and, and there was a baseball field. We called it the baseball field. It wasn't like a regulation <laughs> baseball field. Basically, the entire generation, my father's generation, was working in the White House. My uncle, Sarge Shriver, was the head of the Peace Corps, so he would get off the plane. My uncle, Steve Smith, was the chief of staff in the White House. My father was the attorney general. Uh, my Uncle Teddy was in the United States Senate. He had taken JFK's Senate seat in Massachusetts. And then the president would come off. They would go up and kiss my grandfather, who was at that point disabled. He had had a stroke in 1961. After 1962, after the, um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, they installed my my uncle realized that the the CIA knew almost nothing about what was happening happening in the Kremlin, and that he was surrounded by people uh, within the military brass and the intelligence community who wanted us to go to war. He believed the principal job of a president was to keep the nation out of war, mm -hmm. and he believed that the only way he was going to do that is if he had direct contract contact with Khrushchev. Khrushchev and he, Khrushchev also was very anti-war. Khrushchev had been a general at the Battle of Stalingrad. Um, he had been purged by Stalin. You know, Stalin was meant to kill him, and he had gone instead to Stalingrad. He had seen that was the most horrible battle probably of the war, mm. and he was frightened of war. And he and my uncle uh, exchanged. There was a there was a KGB agent that became friends with my family. We all knew he was a spy, but this is when the James Bond films first started coming out. And we all knew he was a Soviet spy. His name was Georgi Bolshevik. 
And he was a compact little Russian. He could do the Russian dancing so that we all loved him. He would do rope climbing, have rope climbing contests and push-up contests with my dad. <laughs> and he began smuggling, Khrushchev trusted him, and he began smuggling these private letters between Khrushchev and my uncle so that they could talk with each other without their state departments or military brass wow. reading their correspondence. And then in the end, my uncle installed a hotline, which was the first time that had happened. So there was a phone in our house that if you picked it up, Khrushchev would answer. And it allowed the two of them to talk to each other and to try to avoid conflicts that would bring them into war. Um, and then, you know, my father, we were in the middle of the civil rights battles, so my father would um, come home and tell us, you know, that uh, they, I have a note that he wrote me and left on my pillow where he said, today, uh, yesterday, we called out the National Guard to get uh, James Meredith into the University of Miss into Old Miss, and I hope that when you get to college that these troubles will be passed for our country. So he involved us wow. in what was happening. Uh, he came home one day from the Mississippi Delta, and he told us that he had been in a home that day with two families that was smaller than our dining room and that the children ate only one meal a day. Mm -hmm. And he said he would say, when you grow up, I want you to do something about that, to make sure that there aren't children in America who are starving or hungry. Wow. I know you were raised in a very strong Catholic family, and um, some of those values were passed on to you. But it, when you look back at the legacy of your dad as attorney general and JFK as the president, what are some of the victories that stand out to you in your mind? I mean, civil rights, you, miss, you mentioned that, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, what, what else? Yeah, I think, you know, I think my, well, my uncle's, uh, my uncle had been a war hero. He had, um, you know, he had been declared killed in action for a while. His brother was killed during World War II, uh, volunteering for essentially his suicide mission. My other my uncle, Billy Hardington, was killed in the war. My uncle was lost at sea when his PT boat was cut in, in two by a Japanese destroyer. I actually met, the, he invited the Japanese admiral who had sunk his boat to his inauguration, and I got to meet him there. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, but he, you know, he thought war was not a good way to settle political issues. Right. And he, in fact, his friend, friend Bed Bradley asked him what he wanted on his uh, gravestone. And he said he kept the peace. That's what he wanted on there. And I think it probably one of his greatest accomplishments was to keep us out of war. Despite the fact that all of his um, military brass, his close personal advisors wanted him to send 250,000 troops into Vietnam. He ended up selling, sending only military advisors, 16,000 fewer people than he sent to get fewer troops than he sent to get Meredith into the University of Mississippi, one black man. Wow. And so, uh, you know, I think he kind of lived up to, to what he... Um, you know, to that, and then the civil rights movement and all the, the other issues that I think, you know, are part of their legacy. I, you know, I'll tell you, probably one of my most poignant memories of my dad occurred after he died. He was killed on June uh, 6th in 1968 in, um, oh, while running for president. He had just run, won the California primary and he was shot. And I was with him holding his hand when he died. And um, he, we flew him back to New York from Los Angeles. And we waked his body in St. Patrick's. And the, you know, the city was shut down. And there was, uh, the, the sidewalks were filled with people. Ten deep for 50 blocks either way. And then after the wake, or after the, the funeral mass, we put him on the train at um, Union Station in New York, or Penn Station in New York, and we, and we brought the, the, we took him down to Washington, D.C. to be buried. And on that train ride was really an extraordinary event because there were, uh, I think, two million people 
who showed up on the tracks and it slowed the train down so much that a two hour drive, a ride took seven and a half hours. Mm. And we would go through the big train stations in Trenton and in uh, Baltimore and in Philadelphia, and they were loaded with, um, they were just filled, jam-packed with black people uh, singing uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, mm -hmm. Glory, Glory, Hallelujah. And along the tracks, there, were the, there was the face of America. It was white people and black people and Hispanics and priests and nuns and rabbis and ministers. There were, I remember, seeing six nuns standing in the back of a pickup truck holding a sign that said, you know, uh, pray for us, Bobby. There were people holding up their children. Uh, there were hippies and tie-dyed and a lot of military people saluting. Um, we passed ball fields, softball and, you know, uh, baseball fields where the, um, the kids and coaches were all standing at attention. And we got down to New York, and uh, President Johnson met us and then took us up the hill to Arlington to bury him next to his brother under, under, under a plain stone. But on our way up there, we passed the Poor People's Campaign, the Washington Mall, and he and Martin Luther King had had the idea that poor people in America would never get power until they showed some political mm -hmm. strength. And so they had invited all the poor people in the country mm -hmm. to camp out on the, on the mall. And there were thousands of men in shanties and they came to the sidewalk and they're with their heads bowed and they're holding their hats at their chests. And um, they stood there silently as we went by up the hill to bury him. And I remember that was kind of the face of America that I had seen in all the campaigns that I'd been participating in from when I was a little boy. You know, it was the full American experience, mm -hmm. all the different colors. And I remember four years later, I was in studying in Boston at, when I was at college, I was studying political science, and I read polling that showed um, that the, the whites who had been standing by that track between uh, Baltimore and Washington, between Trenton and Washington, and it overwhelmingly supported my father in 1968. Four years later, those same white voters voted not for George McGovern, who was aligned with my father on many issues, but for George Wallace, who was diametrically opposed to everything my father believed, mm. had been a nemesis of my father. And it occurred to me then, and it struck me many times since, that every nation, like every individual, has a darker side and a lighter side. And that the easiest thing for a political leader to do is to appeal to our, you know, to the, all the alchemies of demagoguery, our fear, our anger, our yeah. bigotry, our hatred, our xenophobia, yeah. and our self-interest and, and greed. Mm -hmm. And that, and hatred, and that the much harder thing to do, which was what my father was trying to do, was to get people to see themselves as part of a community, to mm -hmm. transcend their narrow self-interest, yeah. and to say, we're all part of this heroic, noble journey, mm -hmm. and we have to support each other, and to, we have to avoid the seduction of the notion that we can advance ourselves as a people by leaving our poor brothers and sisters mm -hmm. behind or people who don't look just like us. Mm -hmm. We all have to act if we're going to fulfill the destiny of our nation to be an exemplary nation of the rest of the world. We have to find common ground with each other mm -hmm. and, uh, and we have to take risks mm -hmm. and true. we have to, um, you know, we have to somehow transcend our narrow self-interest and act on behalf of a larger principle or yeah. ideal. Well, it was during his time as U.S. Attorney General that Bobby Kennedy gave one of his most moving and unifying speeches. So let's listen to him speak in his own words about his vision for what America could be. I must tell you candidly what our policies are going to be in the field of civil rights and why. I come to you in that spirit. If we are to be truly great as a nation, then we must make sure that nobody is denied an opportunity because of race, creed, or color. 
the Department of Justice will act. We will not stand by and be aloof. We will move. For on this generation of Americans falls the full burden of proving to the world we really mean it when we say that all men are created free and equal before the law. All of us might wish at times that we lived in a more tranquil world, but we don't. And if our times are difficult and perplexing, so are they challenging and filled with opportunity. All right, that's so interesting. How does it make you feel to hear his voice like that? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty used to it. Are you? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's one of the advantages of, of um, you know, growing up the way that I did. My mom, um, because people say to me, you know, you have a tough time because your uncle and dad were killed. And my mom, you know, has always said to us, everybody takes their licks. And that, you know, you kids were in a much better position than other people. There's many, many Americans who lost their parents. Yeah. You had a supportive environment. You had religious faith, which is a gift. Right. Um, you have, you know, an education, an opportunity, and you have a supportive family. And then you have all these reminders of, you know, your parents that are still around and there's kids in Harlem or Watts or Appalachia or, you know, places all over this country who lose their parents, who lose a dad from shooting or from drug addiction, and they don't have those things. Yeah. And that, so I feel like we had a... A very, very big advantage. And as you know, you know, um, life is, uh, is, is, you know, filled with tragedies and it's filled with crises for everybody. Mm -hmm. true. And that, you know, we need to figure out a way to weather those things and oh, to yeah. keep an internal peace and to be useful to other people and be of service. Yes. And that's how we get through those things. So important. What? would you say would your father, where was his greatest strength that you saw? He was driven by passion. And if he saw injustice, he was, uh, he got angrier and angrier. And then he, um, you know, he went after it. Now, and I'll give you an example. During the campaign, the 60 campaign, Martin Luther King was arrested by a Alabama sheriff. Hmm. I think it was Alabama or Mississippi, Alabama sheriff, who put him in a local jail. And my father got a call from Coretta King and from Daddy King, who was Martin's father, Martin Luther King Jr.'s father, saying, we think his life is in danger there. And at that time, blacks were basically voting half Democrat and half um, uh, Republican because the blacks historically were Republican since the Civil yes. War because of Abraham Lincoln. It was only after FDR, after Franklin Roosevelt in the 30s that a lot of blacks started re-looking at the Democratic Party. And my uncle's election was the first where Democrats actually won a majority of blacks, but it was a very thin majority. And it, but it put him over the top. And the reason he won was at that point, the campaign was saying we need to win the South. That uh, for a Democrat, it looked like Nixon could win the Southern states, and that would have sunk my uncle's campaign. He needed to win in the South. And at that time, white Dem um, whites in the South would vote just knee-jerk, reflexively Democratic, and he didn't want to lose that. And if he came out too strongly for Martin, aligned too much with Martin Luther King during the campaign, it could have lost him the South. So the campaign's orthodoxy was we should not be doing that. We should not putting our necks too visibly out for Martin Luther King, even though they were sympathetic with him. But my father got this phone call and he was at home at the time and he was leaving. And he said, um, I don't think I can help he said, let me think about it. And then he drove to National Airport, a 15-minute ride. And while he was driving, he was steaming in his head, thinking of this Southern sheriff who had put him in jail for, uh, for having a taillight out mm. on his car. And clearly they were going to kill him or they were going to you know, harass him in that jail. And by the time he reached... Um, National Airport, he was so hot, 
that he, uh, he called his office and said, get me that sheriff on the phone. And he called the sheriff and he got Martin Luther King arrested. He said, if my brother is elected, which is highly likely, you are going to regret this decision. You better release him tonight. And he got him released. And Daddy King, you know, that never became public at the time, but every black preacher in the South knew that story, thanks to Daddy King, within two days. And that's the reason that he ended up winning the presidency. That's awesome. So amazing. So I think um, you definitely got some of that passion yeah. <laughs> from your dad. Mm -hmm. What do you see happening in the days ahead for Robert Kennedy Jr.? Um, you know, just listen, I wake up every, up every day and say, reporting for duty, sir. And, <laughs> you know, um, I wait to, for my purpose to kind of be revealed. Yeah. I try to keep doing the next right thing. And, um, you know, right now that means fighting against some, uh, you know, some uh, to being at the forefront of a bunch of fights for the environment, for public health and others. And, uh, you know, hopefully I'll, I'll be effective at those. All right. Well, you know, we are out of time. I want you to remember that the greatest impact we have in life is often on those in our very own homes. Who are the men or women that shaped who you are? Do you know that God chose them to be specifically in your life. What legacy did they leave you? What kind of legacy are you going to leave for your children? And how will you build on it to fulfill God's purpose in your life? I think one of the important things that Robert said is that um, we, we see all this division to have on. You talked about it going on, but really, you know, God isn't a Republican or a Democrat or independent or anything else, but he really does desire for us to come together and love one another and uh, that's one of the greatest commandments of all. And um, how do we continue to do what we do? I think it's having a personal relationship with him. And uh, if you're watching today and you want God to ignite that passion in you, stir up that legacy or that termination, um, maybe you don't know how to go about that. That's one of the reasons why we exist. We have amazing prayer partners that are standing by, always ready to pray with you, encourage you. Maybe you're going through something personally. Maybe there's a sickness in your body. Maybe you've lost a loved one. That's why we're here to encourage you and let you know that you are not alone. Uh, you know, Jesus said, I'll, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you to the end of the world. That's a long time. So just be encouraged today. I hope you've enjoyed hearing uh, some of the legacy of Robert's family. I know you have. Again, I want to thank him for joining us today to learn more about Robert Kennedy Jr. and his work. You can visit him online at childrenshelpdefense.org. And if you had someone who impacted your life in a significant way, we'd love to hear your story. You can leave a comment on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, ladies. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye for today.